The Apple II Computer, the first computer to make home computing a thing. It was Apple's first commercially successful computer. My Synthesizer, it is made from the hardware store and some bits of wire. It is not commercially viable at all, but it's fun. For instance, I recently discovered how to play my DIY synth with my Apple II. How, you may ask? Well, that's exactly what I plan to get into in this video. I hope you stick around and enjoy. Okay, I think it's best to start with my synthesizer. Basically, I got inspired to go ahead down the rabbit hole that is sound synthesis and build what is called a modular synth. It's a modular synth because it's made of these modules. Many modules can make up an entire synth rack. The first module I ever built was a 12 volt square wave oscillator based on the ubiquitous 555 chip. That's here. As time went on, literally just a few hours after I built that, I knew I needed more and I needed it now. Enter the Arduino. Through a really wonderful project I found on GitHub, which I will of course link below, I was able to create what they call a voltage-controlled digital core multi-mode oscillator. What's that mean? Well, let's take it word by word. Understanding that an oscillation is the fundamental sound entity that is necessary to start with when synthesizing sound, it would seem very prudent if we could control that oscillation, yes? Enter voltage-controlled. Next, there is a difference between digital and analog insofar as hardware is concerned and how oscillations are generated. Thus, we can see this is a digital solution. We then know, of course, that there are different kinds of synthesis out there. Additive, subtractive, FM. Thus, these are modes, and we have the benefit of a multi-mode oscillator. Okay, great. We're all caught up. Now, without going too deep, this Arduino oscillator provides the fundamental sound with which we mangle and squeeze through various other circuits to get varying sounds. Every synth needs a basic oscillator. This is that. Synthesizers of this kind, vintage and monophonic, are controlled by a voltage. Specifically, one travels a whole octave in one volt worth of electricity. Thus, the metric volt per octave, a standard popularized by Bob Moog in the 1960s. Thus, if one travels a whole octave within one volt, and there are 12 notes in one octave, then one volt can be divided into smaller voltages to achieve the semitones necessary. This is important, and we'll circle back around to this. My synth has an input which can take hold of the oscillator and control it with voltage. Select a low voltage, like one volt, and the synth will play that tone. Select a little higher, like three volts, and the note will sound the same relatively, but it will be up two octaves given our volt per octave arrangement. Wonderful. Let's move on. So here's where the Apple II comes in. A wonderful 8-bit digital machine from an age gone by. But that doesn't mean it can't cut a rug. In fact, the Apple II is perfect for our intentions, as we have such direct control over the hardware, something that today is covered by many layers of user interface. What we need to do is to get the Apple II to send an analog voltage. But how, you may ask, isn't a computer fundamentally digital? Yes, it is. Enter the Digital to Analog Converter, or a DAC, a universally useful tool in interfacing computers with our analog world. What does it do? Exactly what it says it does. It converts a digital value to an analog one. It does this with a specific resolution, as it is known, and the more bits that can report the value to the converter, the more accurate the analog signal coming out the other side. But we don't need anything too robust here. Thus, I have brought a special piece of equipment that was also made in an age in which the Apple II was a little more commonplace. This is a logic controller apparatus that has many modular parts. It was initially designed for model trains. Just imagine running an entire model train kit off the Apple II, or any other 80s 8-bit computer. I even have the interface for the Commodore 64, but that's another story. 
What we can do with this basic logic controller is to plug it in to the provided DAC pack, which is the key to the lock of our automated synthesis. In one end will go an 8-bit value we provide to the computer. Out the other end will be a voltage ranging from 0 to 2.5 volts. As this device has inherently an 8-bit resolution, the maximum amount of steps we can fit into 2.5 analog volts is 256. In computer speak, that is a range of 0 to 255, because 0 counts as a value. And fundamentally, that's it. I can use the provided documentation to know that our interface card is attributed to the Apple II I.O. address 45395. With that address, we can either peek at the existing value in that register, or we can poke a value into it. This is the vernacular used by Apple's included operating system, so to speak, the AppleSoft basic computer language. Thus, now that we know we can poke a value from 0 to 255 into the register 45395, those values representing a voltage from 0 to 2.55, we can then plug the output from the DAC into the volt per octave gate of the synthesizer, and the Apple II will then assume control, receiving pure voltages instead of binary bits thanks to our converter. Here's an example of some fiddling around with this concept. So we knew this was in um, a random state when we started it. I'm going to flip the, the sound back on so we can just hear that horrible noise. Um, there's that. So in order to silence that without touching the machine and via the DAC we have here, we're going to uh, poke a value into um, register 49395 and then there's a comma, and now we put the value that we want to poke in there. So we're gonna turn this back on. Zero would mean silence, right? And then uh, it's 256 steps to the topmost voltage, which means uh, effectively on the computer, and that's zero to 255, not one to 256. So the top number we can put in for the maximum voltage into the synth is 255, and the lowest number is zero. So to silence it, it's zero, to change the, cap the capacity of the sound um, with the maximum voltage is 255. So let's go ahead and turn this back on. I'm going to hit input zero, and now we just put that command in the computer, and it silences it. Effectively, that's good enough proof for me, but let's carry on to prove that this works even better. So like I said, we have um, a range of zero to 255, so let's put in another number and see what that sounds like. So poke 49395. Let's say 123. Different sound altogether we've got there. And the beautiful thing about it is you can still play with your uh, parameters on the synth itself. And uh, yeah, so it's, it's really fun. So ultimately the next step here, let's um, hope four, nine, file into silence. The next step is to create a program. Okay, so I've written a simple basic program which I'll flash on the screen and um, we'll discuss each part of the, uh, the code to see what's happening here. I'll talk you through each bit here. 10 through uh, line 10 through 60 ultimately create those first two notes with uh, they, they make them play for about a half second delay. And then we have line 70 to 101 um, give us the frequency sweep from zero volts up to five. And we're gonna see what that sounds like right now by running the program. So we type run and we hit enter and we listen. Two notes. Frequency sweep. epic and the program is designed to stop uh, after it's reached the maximum of 255 steps. So that is our Apple II linked to a digital to analog converter 
by this wonderful device, which I feel very fortunate to have gotten. I think they're still available on the website, which I will link below. Um, they ultimately were a um, train model train company. So you can see how this would be um, useful in a model train setup if anyone's ever been involved in that, where you could you know, create digital values and put them out onto, say, um, you know, lights that run at certain um, dimness or maybe a DC motor, uh, which requires analog control, could uh, be ran at a certain speed if you had a digital value you wanted to input into the DAC. But you can run anything with a DAC because the, that takes analog input, which a synth does. Um, because we have a digital signal, which is converted by the DAC, an 8-bit resolution DAC. I believe it's called a Ferranti DAC, which Ferranti was an old chip maker in the 70s. I don't know if they're still active, but I know that I've seen that name in vintage computer circles for um, various chip manufacturers in the 70s and 80s. So I assume they utilized that inside of this DAC. Um, we saw the uh, schematic drawing, uh, which, you know, pretty monolithic, the word DAC, but I, it's the Ferranti DAC, which has an 8-bit resolution. It's listed here in the manual. And to me, that, that's great. So we heard two notes that were made. I could spend a lot of time making a basic program, which I, I mean, I could even write a program which took the input of this analog joystick and if I press up on the joystick, then I could make my synth rise in notes or do anything really. And then I could, you know, conversely, I could write it to go down if I went down the um, joystick. These could trigger certain things like parameters within the synth. So anyways, this is just a really exciting project for me. I'm really grateful and um, impressed with myself that I'm capable of merging the Apple II, a wonderful system from the late 1970s and early 80s into a synth which is modeled on late 70s, early 80s synths. And all with the help of this awesome DAC pack and this uh, model train controller system from DCP Micro Development. I believe I still have, at the making of this video, leftover stock, which um, you could buy for your Apple II or your C64. They also have one for um, the BBC Micro. So thanks for joining me on this episode of Joshua Coleman Makes. I hope this was uh, somewhat fun and inspirational and, uh, if anything, just entertaining because who doesn't like flashy lights and computer stuff linking to other computer stuff, which was aided and embedded by other computer stuff. Thank you very much for watching and I uh, hope to see you on the next video.